Welcome and thank you for joining our post-election market webinar as we discuss implications and market impacts of the 2020 presidential election. I'm Anthony Valeri, Director of Investment Management. Before we begin, let me say that as a disclaimer, this is, um, webinar is meant to describe the impacts and implications. We realize that politics can be a very personal view, so we realize that there are uh, two sides to every coin, but we do our best here to just simply reflect what the market is pricing in on potential policy changes and market impact. So with that, let's go ahead and begin and start with where we where things stand now. And here is data through November 7th. And as I record this, the morning of November 9th, little has changed. Uh, as of now, Joe Biden is the president-elect. President Trump has filed lawsuits in several states, and there are recounts uh, going on as well. So it's not over yet. Votes don't get certified officially until early December, so things could change. Biden does have a lead, uh, but again, it, certainly it's within the realm of possibility for the outcome to change. Uh, with that said, recounts historically have not produced much change. 2000 was the most recent example, and that recount only in Florida only resulted in a change of about 200 votes. And that historically has been the case. It's just come down to a few hundred votes. Uh, whether legal challenges will result in anything meaningful, keep in mind uh, President Trump has to had a reversal in Pennsylvania, a win there, and two additional states. So again, it's it's a long shot for President Trump to reverse this, but again, certainly not out of the realm of possibility. Moving to the Senate, it looks as though Republicans are very close to 50 seats. There, Georgia has announced there will be a runoff for two other seats, which are currently, uh, where Republicans are currently leading. Uh, that runoff will occur January 5th. And if Democrats surprise and win there, it would be 50-50 with the tie broken by the vice president. If that happens, that could give the Democrats the blue wave that had been talked about uh, in it before. Uh, but again, Republicans leading both of those races. So it looks like divided government is here, but we won't know for certain until early January. In the House, uh, the Republicans have gained five may gain an additional five as the votes continue to be counted. And again, this does reflect um, a 50-50 country. It was a very close race. So at this point, it's very important to understand that they're, to understand one's point of view, whether from either side and try to move forward as best possible. So that's where we stand on the election, more of a divided government. And what does that really mean? Well, if the divided government holds it means that any major, the likelihood of any major legislation is unlikely. So that means that fiscal stimulus is still likely, but it's expected to be smaller in the 750 billion to 1 trillion range with timing of late January or, or, or sometime in February once the president is sworn in. Uh, major changes to taxes are unlikely, even if the Democrats do get that 50 seats in the Senate. Some of the more moderate Democrats may not approve of a massive or a big tax increase. So the the, the likelihood again of a, a major change to taxes is 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 rather unlikely here. Infrastructure spending is possible. Both sides have been in favor of infrastructure, but the dis difference comes in terms of dollar amount. Uh, Democrats wanting a bigger infrastructure uh, package relative to Republicans. It's possible something gets done there as well, but it'd be a smaller dollar amount. We had some market imp uh, reaction to that as well. Uh, a divided Congress does not limit regulation. The president can still act on his own with the executive order for regulation. So energy and financial institutions uh, under the crosshairs as well from regulation under a Biden presidency. Trade is likely to be more friendly under a Biden presidency, but China-U.S. likely relations likely to remain tense. There is bipartisan support for, for a harder line uh, on China, just to the magnitude of difference between who's in office. And then finally, uh, big tech scrutiny is lessened, but still present. Both sides are willing to take a closer look at the dominance of the big tech companies. House Democrats passed um, antitrust 
legislation or a, a version of it this summer, which really was going to call for, for a, a potential breakup of the big tech companies and really provide some close scrutiny. Markets haven't reacted to it. Again, the, op the probability of that is now lessened as a result of divided government. So let's take a closer look and some of the early winners and losers uh, following the election, and a lot can change uh, in the coming days, weeks, and months. But bonds were the initial winner. The prospect of reduced stimulus meant lower growth expectations. It also meant less bond issuance, both of which is favorable for bonds. We had initial rally in treasury bonds. Technology and healthcare, just due to the leadership, technology le less likely to be imp impl or impacted by antitrust, um, also going to benefiting from that. Healthcare, where Biden was going to take a closer look across uh, the entire industry to lower costs, also benefiting. Emerging market equities on a better trade tone have bounced higher. And then growth stocks, a little bit more of the status quo. And these are your higher growth, higher revenue generating companies that have benefited from the work from home environment. Among the initial losers, materials in response to the prospects of a reduced infrastructure package. So construction materials, metals underperforming, utilities also underperforming on that metric. And then financials, particularly the banks, uh, for two reasons. One is interest rates came down, uh, and then the prospect of additional or more regulation. Uh, the Green New Deal is unlikely in a divided Congress. Renewable energy, to a lesser degree, is la uh, lagging as a result. And then value stocks, which are really dependent on higher interest rates, inflation, and better economic growth, uh, lagging as the prospects of reduced stimulus are hitting the market. That's the early reaction. Things uh, can certainly change. On uh, November 9th, Monday, we received news of a vaccine breakthrough and starting to see some partial reversal of these trades. So that'll be something to watch in the coming days. Bond yields higher, bond prices lower as economic growth path prospects are improved on that vaccine outlook. You're also seeing some of the laggards from the pandemic, such as financials and energy rebound. So a lot can change quickly in the current environment. We will continue to update you and provide progress on that throughout the coming weeks. So that's the early reaction uh, from the markets. Uh, if we look uh, at the implications on a sector basis, this is through the end of last week following the election. So since the end of uh, election day, November 3rd, when at the close of that of business, technology through the end of the week outperformed 7.4%. Communication services, which include some of the tech companies, also strong. Consumer discretionary, uh, benefiting from reduced or the much less likelihood of higher taxes. And as we mentioned, healthcare, uh, because of divided government, unlikely to see harsher legislation. Uh, all of those sectors outperformed. Again, the laggards, materials and industrials on reduced infrastructure, energy, uh, utilities also on reduced infrastructure, energy because the regulation outlook likely to remain tight. And you can see the same for financials. So that was the initial reaction. And again, as I mentioned, as that vaccine news hits the market today, seeing a little bit of a reversal of that, but that's the initial vote from the stock market on how it impacts various sectors. When we move now to what does it mean on a longer term basis, we have been big proponents that elections in the long run are not big drivers of the stock market. You can see that here under various political regimes. The S&P 500, a measure of U.S. stocks, has had pretty strong performance across the board, whether it's a Democratic president on the left or a Republican president on the right, and whether Congress is united or against the president or split. 2000 is uh, the third bar from the left, the Democratic president with a split Congress. It is a rare combination. It's only happened four times, and uh, that when it did happen, the return was almost 16%. We don't expect 16% annualized returns. Our longer-term forecasts call for about 6 to 8% for global stocks over the next three to five-year horizon, uh, but it does show you that performance has generally been strong under this combination. It also shows you that no matter who's in power, stock market takes its cues from the economy, the level of interest rates, and inflation rather than who's in power. So important note to, to keep in mind. And if we look at the underlying health of the stock market, important to keep in mind it is in an uptrend. We're still seeing a firm stock market since the March 
lows, one way to measure that is to look at consumer discretionary versus consumer staples, consumer staples being more conservative. A rising line means that consumer discretionary is outperforming consumer staples and vice versa. And you can see that that trend has broadly held since the lows of late March, a little dip for consumer discretionary at the end of October, uh, but that has rebounded. And really, this doesn't change, in my view, the underlying trajectory of the market. This is still a healthy market in an uptrend. Even if the trajectory of that uptrend slows, we're not seeing any of the internal metrics that suggests a renewed bear market by any stretch. So when we look at the health of the market, it is still healthy. And that does include corrections. As we saw in September, uh, the S&P peaked to trough down 10%, NASDAQ down 13%. In October, the S&P down 8% peaked to trough. So those types of dips, those corrections or pullbacks, that's normal. It's part of a healthy market. We're likely to see more of that as this uh, election and transition continues. Now, let us move to another metric of the equity market and its health, earnings. In our view, this is the key driver of stock prices over time, and earnings have been strong again. The third quarter earnings season is almost over, about 90% complete. 86% of S&P 500 companies have beaten expectations. That is well above the average of 65%. And yes, the expectations going into this earnings season were, were low. The bar was set low. But the fact is companies have really beaten those expectations more so than many thought. And when you have 86% of companies outperforming, which is a historic peak, that says a lot about the rebound in corporate America. And what started to be an eight... Um, an 18 or an ex expectation of an 18% decline in earnings is now on track to decline 8%. So a big difference. In fact, the key estimate or underlying theme for markets is that uh, the S&P 500 will recoup all of the profits by the end of 2021. So in other words, reach the late 2019 peak by the end of 2021. Uh, as a result of the third quarter earnings season, or S &P, there's a chance that that could be recouped or profits could be recouped by the third quarter of 2021, which would be faster than the two and three quarters years it typically takes following a recession. So that faster than anticipated recovery that is embedded within the stock market recovery continues to be to remain on track and is a key driver of stock prices. The fourth quarter is generally a good one. For the stock market, those blue bars represent quarterly performance. You can see the fourth quarter is generally the strongest, up 3.9% on average since 1950. The red bars represent an election year, presidential election year, and the fourth quarter is a little more muted in the fourth quarter of a presidential election year, but still positive. Uh, those uh, diamond-shaped uh, uh, illustrations show the percentage of the time that the quarter produces a positive return. Uh, and you can see that both in all years and in presidential election years, it is firmly positive, around 80% positive. So if history is any guide, the fourth quarter is a good one for investors. And so far, that is holding true to form. Uh, if we look at the bond market, yields did dip post-election, but you can see the trend moving higher. We think that that trend could be short-term, the, the trend lower. Uh, reason being is that even with this election outcome of divided government and less stimulus, we do think the economy is going to rebound on its own. We're seeing continued improvement in the economic data, likely to come a little more slowly, but improving nonetheless. We continue to see employment improving, and that's going to ultimately put upward pressure on interest rates. Not that we see a sharp move higher, but we do expect interest rates to move higher over the course of the coming year. If we look more closely at the municipal market, uh, this was a sector that potentially stood to benefit greatly from a blue wave and, and potentially higher taxes. And while there's a slight chance of that still, um, munis really uh, didn't have held their own here recently. Valuations entered the election cheap, and that's measured as a percentage of treasury yields. The higher muni yields are relative to treasuries, the more attractive they are. And you can see that even with recent improvement as um, munis have started to recoup part of that active relative to treasuries with yields even to treasuries essentially you're getting the tax benefit of municipal bonds for free um, there was a big surge in issuance in october and, and september which pressured the market seeing a little bit of a relief uh, in the, the municipal market and we still think this is an area for 
high quality investors. And we still think bonds work to provide protection on the downside. And we find municipal bond valuations are attractive, even if they don't get that catalyst from the prospect of higher taxes, which would make their income more attractive. And then before I conclude, just finally a reminder that the stock market has rewarded investors under a variety of precedents. And again, this speaks to a prior slide that I showed where it's ultimately about the economy, the level of interest rates, inflation, uh, corporate profits that drive the stock market. You can see here that under a variety of presidents, whether Democratic or Republican, the stock market has managed to produce gains. So I would encourage you not let uh, your political view influence your investments. Uh, stay with a diversified investment plan. We certainly think cash is punitive and it will pay to stay invested. That is all I have for this webinar. Thank you very much for attending. We appreciate your business and we look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you.